Mae Tucker was born the youngest of seven in a blended family in Portland, Oregon. She was described as tall for her age, standing 5 foot 11. She was independent, athletic, dedicated, and a beautiful goofball. Barbara played basketball at Cleveland High School, and in the summertime, she worked at Sears. Barbara sewed, knitted, crocheted, and loved arts and crafts, and was the first in her family to go to college. She dreamed of opening her own craft supply shop one day after she got a business degree. When she was 19 years old, she was a sophomore studying business at Mount Hood Community College. On the evening of January 15, 1980, she began walking from her apartment on Northeast 23rd Street to a night class. She was then seen running onto Northeast Kane Drive from a wooded area west of campus. Multiple witnesses driving by at the time said that they thought they saw her waving, as if she was trying to get people's attention, but they all believed it was a college prank. Witnesses told police that many drivers had to swerve and brake to keep from hitting her running in the road, and one car almost did. One witness told authorities they saw a man come out of the shrubs and grab her by the arm and lead her toward the school's campus. One witness remembered even seeing blood and dirt on her face, but sadly, no one stopped to help. The next morning, a student found her partially clothed body in the bushes with her books and purse nearby. In 2015, DNA collected from the original crime scene was sent to Parabon Nano Labs to create a DNA profile. Several years later, on June 9, 2021, the Gresham police identified and arrested 57-year-old Robert Plimpton for the murder of Barbara Tucker. Even with DNA proof, he would still plead not guilty to the charge of rape and murder. Robert is a longtime Troutdale resident who is married with two children. At the time of Barbara's murder, he was a 16-year-old student at Reynolds High School. Oregon Department of Corrections records show he was convicted of second-degree kidnapping in 1985 in Multnomah County and served a 30-month sentence that ended in December 1987. He served two other six-month stints in prison between 1993 and 1997 for driving under the influence and parole violations. In 1997, a woman accused him of driving her to a secluded area and attacking her. He was accused of attempted sodomy and assault, but the case was dismissed after a grand jury found insufficient evidence to file a criminal complaint. While the break in the case provides some comfort for her sisters, Susan and Alice, it also has reignited their grief. Sadly, her mother, Louise Tucker, died in 1995, and her father, Albert Tucker, died in 1989. Barbara's death left them heartbroken, and her sisters say that it was the first time they saw their father cry. Robert remains in custody at the Multnomah County Detention Center, and although he has not faced trial as of August 2021, Barbara's family at least has answers after 41 years. Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone was born May 27, 1951. She would move from Quebec, Canada to Carmel, California sometime in the 1970s. She married in 1976, and the couple had a daughter, but they would eventually divorce. Sonia worked as a sales rep for Levi Strauss while raising her daughter. On October 15, 1981, at the age of 30, her friend Caroline found her body lying inside her front door. She had been strangled and possibly sexually assaulted. Her neighbor, 25 years old at the time, Michael Glazebrook, was identified as a suspect in her killing and went to trial in 1983. During the trial, one forensic serologist said that he had found no indications of sexual assault. However, the chief medical examiner for San Francisco contradicted that, saying she actually was sexually assaulted. During the trial, a witness for the prosecution, a friend of Michael's, recanted her story that she had previously given, stating that Michael had told her he was inside Sonia's home the morning of the murder. She also explained that he told her that the scratch seen on his face following the murder came from an argument at Monterey Peninsula College the day after the murder. The next day in court, Michael's parents would testify that they never saw a scratch on their son's face. Even with all the contradicting information, there were witnesses that placed him near Sonia's home around the time of her murder. In February 1983, the defense would try and have the murder charges against Michael thrown out, but the judge refused. 
However, he did acknowledge that he most likely could not find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and on June 20th, 1983, the murder charges were dismissed. Months later, Michael was tried for a second time and pleaded not guilty. The defense stated that Michael was arrested on two outstanding traffic warrants, but was then questioned about Sonia's murder. Arresting him on traffic warrants, but questioning him about murder interfered intentionally. Later in the year, some neighbors testified that Michael was not at home at the time of the murder. One neighbor said that Michael's green pickup truck was not in front of his house, and another saw him driving away. One witness said that Michael was with him at his place of work until 10.15 to 10.45 a.m. There are several explanations as to how he got the bad scratch on his face at the same time of the murder. In the papers, it was explained that he was struck by a piece of plexiglass while he was working on a boat in the backyard of his home. Moreover, if this story is true, then the story about getting hurt during an argument at Monterey Peninsula College would not be. Sonia did have blood under one of her fingernails, and that blood was not hers. An emergency room physician testified that the laceration on his face was not consistent with a scratch from a fingernail. The doctor said that he treated the wound himself the day after the murder. To make matters worse, investigators said that they had destroyed their original outline style notes after they typed up the interview reports. In other words, there was no way to check back on what was said and what the officer actually wrote down before it all got typed into a statement. The defense attorney noted the discrepancies between the typed statements and those on the stand by witnesses. On December 8, 1983, once again, the murder charges were dropped. In 2020, sheriff's detectives and the DA decided to re-examine Sonia's case. They found several pieces of evidence that could be tested for DNA using technology that didn't exist in the 80s. The items were sent to the Department of Justice DNA lab for testing. Detectives also obtained a search warrant for a new sample of Michael's DNA. Not surprisingly, the evidence from the crime scene was a match to Michael's DNA. On August 16, 2021, detectives conducted surveillance at his home in the city of Seaside, California. At about 8 p.m., he drove away from his home and was stopped and taken into custody. The now 65-year-old suspect was booked into the Monterey County Jail on a warrant for murder, and his bail was set at a million dollars. In honor of Sonia, all the detectives wore Levi jeans during the operation to arrest Michael. Michael took the life of Sonia Stone 40 years ago, and since then, he has been able to live a free life, graduating from high school, working at Home Depot, studying photography, umpiring baseball games, and he even drove a school bus at one point. Thanks to DNA, Sonia will finally get the justice she deserves, and her murderer will be behind bars. <laughs>